Hello, and welcome to the Giants in Disguise podcast. My name is Usman, and I will be taking you on a journey with some of the individuals who have inspired me to push my physical and emotional boundaries, to believe in myself and in my ideas. Ideas that have taken me to some incredible places and meet some incredible people. In this podcast, I hope to share the stories of those individuals, and I hope that they inspire you to challenge yourself and find the giant within you. Today I speak with Osman at Asham Manwar, a Pakistani living in London. We speak about his love for the mountains, some of the profound experiences he's had while traveling, and his attempt to retrace the footsteps of the famous Muslim explorer Ibn Battuta. I know the I think yeah. some of the most profound encounters in human kindness you encounter when you're journeying slowly. I probe more into his childhood and the reasons why he loves to be in nature. Praying in the mountains is a very profound experience too, right? You're like in a tiny tent, you're huddled, you're literally surrounded by nature. No modern gadgets, nothing to distract your thoughts. So when you're there, you're literally there. You're more humble and you're you're more exposed in a way. It kind of kills your sort of ego and arrogance in a way, like you know, because there's so many things that are beyond your control that can happen in nature. This. is the giants in disguise podcast welcome to the podcast <laughs> um so let's kick off things and go back to your childhood so just talk me through what your childhood was like where you grew up so so basically i mean my father was in the army right we kept moving a lot throughout the country and any time he was posted in a hard area like tatapani or azad kashmir where which weren't really family friendly stations so we would live in lahore with our grandparents house with my paternal grandparents and that really was like a was was one of the best i think it it, it was one of the best things in my early childhood life because my grandparents had a huge house my cousins who were very close to uh, on my on my father's side like my aunts kids they were very similar age group to us as well so we used to play cricket did all the same things and we were they were living in the same household too at the time because they were their father was also posted in the army and was moving around so a lot of the times my my early childhood was like spent a lot with uh with cousins and we were all pretty close like every eid every summer holidays we would all be going e- either to murri or some other place like together or just spending time in lahore at our grandparents house so so yeah we had, so i have like very fond memories of my grandparents home until like we turned 13 and then my my father sent us to boarding school me and my elder brother so my father and his brother went to the same boarding school and hasan abdul so that I I went there from age 13 to 18 so that was like pretty much before my end of my teens and start. Mhm. Um do you think you were adventurous as a child? I was quite mischievous as a dark child. I mean I I was always excited about adventures like the the good thing was that from uh, from a very young age like uh, my one uh, my even my grandparents um so my my father was born in the uk my grandfather was also in the military and at that time there weren't many he was in the first pm along course which meant like pakistan at that time did not have many established institutions so he was in the electrical and mechanical engineering corps so he had he did a lot of training in the uk so he came to loughborough university and so my parents uh, my on my father's side specifically they I remember like when we were kids like us uh, one of our aunts sat us down would show us like this whole slide show of their travels through Jordan through through uh, through all the Middle East because they they even drove from uh, UK to Pakistan so I, it was always like for me that those kind of memories of looking at your grandparents photos and the photos of my parents and siblings and ca- I'm sorry not siblings their siblings and traveling through like Jordanian desert or through Saudi or even through uh, the continental Europe even was quite stuck to me as a kid like I couldn't travel at that time but all of those memories like kind of and also my father was a mountaineer like before he got married <laughs> so looking mm-hmm. at his pictures i mean i remember like when we when we were posted in quetta 
uh, both me and my little brother used to fight to sleep in uh, one of the sleeping bags that my father had. He had two. One was like more uh, camouflage, like with the uh, military sort of uh, green and light green colors. And the other one was a less exciting one. So, so all of those things, I think, definitely contributed to how or what, what I saw life or adventurous life as. And it, it definitely shaped what I wanted to do later on in my sort of years when I finally was able to do things. And and what about inspirations? Did you have any inspirations growing up? Um, who did you look up to the most? I think from, from an outdoorsy point of view, it was definitely my father, like looking at his pictures. Even like, I mean, yeah, I think they, in general, my, my, the, uh, my, my, father's side of the family was had traveled a lot like i think they traveled a lot in their childhood partly due to circumstances because my grandfather was in the military and he had to he served in jordan in uk he was posted quite in quite a few different countries like early on in his career and i think their their pictures their sort of stories even from about their times living in different countries and then i think yeah all of those kind of contributed but predominantly i think from a from the point of view of like outdoors and nature i think my i i probably was subconsciously more influenced by my father but later on like i think one of my my biggest motive like one of the biggest uh, sort of triggers to go traveling was when i came across uh, uh, the travel log of ibn batuta and i felt like that 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 was one of the most uh, i think that that really uh, sort of resonated with me when i was reading his uh, travel log and the fact that you know it's a muslim traveler he's a muslim traveler like otherwise most of the travel accounts or anything that you read as ch- in during childhood is also like adventures of tom sawyer or adventures of huckleberry finn and or Enid Blyton and Hardy Boys, you can relate to them to a certain level, but not to the extent where... So I think when I, when I, when I came across Ibn Batuta, like at that, uh, before that, I was reading a lot about Sufism as well. And naturally I had this inclination to travel to you. So when I, when I stumbled across his book, I felt like it, it, it seemed like the perfect amalgam of the kind of guy like who I could relate to at a certain spiritual level as well and also like his his observations about different places and the era that he traveled to was induced like a strange nostalgia as well so so for me that was all of those were things were like pretty yeah very very interesting like as a traveler Hmm. do you feel like you related to Ibn Batuta on some level like you he was a Muslim traveler and do you think that impacted the way you chose to seek your adventures? Ab- absolutely. Like, I think that that was definitely one of the main triggers. Like, I, I felt like this was somebody who, who was not white, whose native language was not continental European language, who was less known in the world than he deserved to be. Like, it's shocking. Ibn Batuta traveled twice the distance Marco Polo did. He traveled for 29 years. He's roughly a contemporary of Marco Polo, considering that um, Ibn Battuta set out in 1324 and Marco Polo died in 1323. I, I, can, I bet you now, if you do a survey of London, there would be a handful of people who would have heard the name Ibn Battuta. And I can tell you by, by even in the organization that I was working at when I was planning to quit my job and go traveling, none of them knew. And they were all uh, pretty well educated people like from from different walks of life and from different countries too in fact like it's it's shocking for me even when i went to morocco uh in tangier which was his hometown the first day uh the first two three days i actually more than that maybe i think i spent three four days in tangier and um the hostel i was staying at was roughly 10 minutes walk from it was in the heart of the center and was maybe five to ten minutes walk from where the hostel was Every single person I met in that hostel in Tangier, which is hometown of Ibn Battuta and where he's buried and the city that is should be known for being the home of Ibn Battuta. Nobody knew in that hostel who Ibn Battuta was. 
even the guy who was Moroccan who worked at the reception, he knew him. He did not know where his uh, where Ibn Battuta was buried or where his mausoleum was. So for me, those things were shocking, like how Eurocentric history is. And I think it, it really shows like, you know, the entire view of the world historically used to be towards the East. Now, like, I mean, history used to be taught as like, I mean, everyone, all the, all the empires wanted to expand to East, right? Western uh, Roman Empire, they wanted to expand to East. Eastern Roman Empire was created for that reason. All the spice trade, everything, if you look at it, it's all, everything was going towards the East. However, in the last two, three hundred years, our narrative of history has been completely twisted. Like, especially like for young Muslims, like there, there is actually no role model. Like we, we are so colonized in our thinking and colonized in, in our role models and ideals that we, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a tragedy in a way. I mean, Peter Frankopan has like uh, written a book like Silk, Silk Roads and New History of the World. Initially, I was very reluctant of buying that book because I felt like, what would this guy know about Silk Roads, the history of the world? But then when I attended a talk at LSE where he was giving a public lecture about his book, the premise of his book was also, in fact, that, that history in Europe has been taught in a very Eurocentric way, whereas, in fact, mm-hmm. every single thing used to point towards the East. And that's what prompted me to buy that book. And through that book, when I was reading that, I found in, uh, even more interesting uh, Muslim travelers like from uh, Osama ibn Munqid or uh, there was another guy uh, I've gotten like, I find, I, uh, Ibn Jubair, yeah, Ibn Jubair. His travel diaries are phenomenal. Osama ibn Munqid's uh, uh, travel log, uh, his, uh, his life story, because he was based in Syria. And uh, around that time, there was a lot of crusades happening. His, uh, his accounts of his times is beautifully written and phenomenal like so i can't i mean ibn jubair is now my second uh, like is definitely one of the key travelers that i've uh, found his book like i've finished uh, i finished reading it maybe last year i think but even his account is phenomenal and these are the people that you can relate to because they were traveling in a world which is i mean that their times are way more fascinating fascinating than ours all the travel was slow land-based you actually meet interact with everyone that you're journeying along the way as opposed to instantaneous like flying from one city to another landing in a beach resort and then just forgetting like you you, hardly anyone knows about the country they go like people actually just know the resorts they go to which is which is the -hmm. tragedy of modern travel in a way but yeah so (laughs) the short answer is yeah (laughs) Ibn Vaduta was quite inspirational I felt like even though I didn't share a language, but like in some ways I know a little bit of Arabic. I actually did a course in Arabic before I left uh, to go to okay. to 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 go to Tangier and then kind of roughly retrace his footsteps. But fearing the inevitable risk to the cultural heritage and historical wealth of the Middle East, Osman just had to embark on this trip. So he starts his journey as Ibn Battuta did from his hometown in Tangier. When I decided, okay, where to start was it was very intuitive to where to go, because it, Tangier was Ibn Battuta's hometown, and that's where he was buried. So I flew in from London to Tangier. I spent around three, four, five days in Tangier. From Tangier, I went to Chefchaouen, which is like a beautiful. Uh, it's called the Blue City in the in the hills or the mountains of uh, on the sort of end of the Atlas Range, like which spans from the. Uh, southwest to the northeast uh, of Morocco. Yeah. From there, I went down to Fez. In Fez, I spent a couple of days as well. One of the most beautiful. It's it's the oldest. Uh, it's one of the oldest uh, medinas that is preserved. It's got. I think it's the mm-hmm. biggest pedestrianized uh, medina in the world. Like uh, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site as well. Um, Fez was phenomenal. Like. After that, I went to Merzouga, which was where I spent my first few, two nights in the desert. Like, that was a phenomenal experience, actually. I think, like, yeah. sleeping in a desert in the, in the open sky, like, where you can see all the stars, like, stillness and quietness. If, if I were to pick, like, one of the top experiences that I had in Morocco, like, it was certainly uh, the Sahara Desert, actually. And then from there, I went to Marrakesh. I wanted to incorporate like a little bit of outdoors in my trip too. So I, 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 I climbed like uh, 
uh, Mount Tukal, which is the highest in North Africa. Lost in the beauty of the land, Oswan ended up spending more time exploring than he had originally planned for. And I had taken four, four months off. And you know, like, okay. Ibn Abududa had 29 years. And there was no chance I could do everything. In fact, even in the yeah. places that he went to Morocco, like, so one of the places, one of the, one of the old towns, like Sijil Masa, it's in complete ruins. Nobody goes there. It used to be like the hub for trading because gold, uh, a lot of uh, West African gold, like from Mali, used to get exported and like the trade caravans used to stop in Sijil Masa. But Sijil Masa is now no longer anything. It's just desolate completely. Like even the ruins are pretty much like you can you can't find many ruins either. So are you planning to do the whole journey that um, Ibn Battuta did? Yeah, I think that's the thing. Like, so I only managed to do like a very small section. So I went to Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Jordan, and Palestine. And my my three three and a half months were over. And then the last fifteen months, I trekked in the northern areas of Pakistan. Like I had left that. So it's it's always been sort of in the back of my mind to want to go and continue that. In fact, one of the, I mean, I haven't planned anything around that. But one of the things I had in mind was to actually cycle from UK to Pakistan and along that way incorporate all the countries that Ibn Abuddha went through in the in Central Asian part and mm-hmm. and Eastern Europe. Uh, in that, actually, he didn't, I'm not sure like if the Eastern Europe featured, but like Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, all of those countries. Even he yeah. went to Pakistan through the, through Kabul and via the... Uh, I'm guessing I I don't recall directly from memory right now whether it was which route exactly he took, but he went through Multan and then to Delhi and served in the, spent quite a bit of time in India too, and at that okay. time the whole region was the Indian subcontinent. So so yeah, I, I want to kind of do this journey and overlap with with my sort of continuation of Ibn Abdullah's experience. So now I'm kind of doing like any country that I go to, I try to find which parts of that country Ibn Battuta went to and then overlap mm-hmm. my kind of trip with that. Because it gives you a lot more historical perspective and insight and and a way to actually have a much more profound experience. For me, it's really important to know the history of the place, the culture, and to be able to really enjoy and compare and contrast the experience and how 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 much certain places have changed. And I think a lot of the times what I found was like you find like spiritual anecdotes or even cultural anecdotes yeah. when you're reading Ibn Battuta's log and then you find like, okay, yeah, I should try that. This is how I actually went to one place in Egypt called Humaysra. Like I had mm-hmm. no one, like even my Egyptian friend when I reached Cairo, she was like, she's never heard of it. And Humaysra mm-hmm. back then used to be a big pilgrimage route like via Humaysra to Aydab. So people would go from Aydab, take the boat across the Red Sea to Jeddah when they would go on a, on, on a pilgrimage. And since the whole form of travel has changed and everything, like the, nobody goes there. And even when I went there, I had to take a lift on a, on a water tanker. So <laughs> the water tanker used to deliver water every day because Humaysra is literally in the desert. It's this very small village and uh, nobody went there. There was no public transportation going there. So I, mm-hmm. so I got dropped the night before, like on the side of a, yeah, that was one. <laughs> Interesting story, but yeah. So did you really recreate Ibn Battuta's journey on land by walking? Or was it by other means as well? Yeah, no, I think I wish I did. Like, I wish it was all human powered. But there were Mm. some logistical reasons as well. Like, for example, between Morocco and uh, Tunisia, it's Algeria. And Algeria, you can't cross the border and you need the visa. And Morocco and Algeria have have had, like, historical clashes and stuff. So... Um, and there were places where you could certainly, but due to lack of time, the heat in the desert, mm-hmm. the fact that there were nobody, were, people would look at you and think like, why are you actually thinking of going on a camel right? <laughs> <laughs> when you can catch a train or, I mean, it would be phenomenal yeah. to actually do a human power journey. But when I went to Egypt, it was peak of the summer and was brutally hot. So, yeah. so no, mo- most of my journeys were, I did try to go by land wherever I could. So by sea or land, that was my preferred mode of travel. So either by train, by bus, like for example, between Jordan and, uh, and uh, e- Egypt and Jordan, I took the ferry. And then from Jordan to Palestine, I took the, took the bus route. Um, 
Yeah, I think traveling by land and especially in conditions like those um, gives you a sense of perspective and appreciation of how they traveled. I think some of the most profound encounters in human kindness you encounter when you're journeying slowly. I'll I'll give you an example. Like when I had to go to Humaysara, right? I went to one of the big towns called Aswan, where where a lot of people go to uh, Abu Simbel, where they have the they had to relocate some of the old temples and palaces, right? It's one of the so from Aswan I took like a van, and the van the guy I had to literally ask a few people a lot of people helped me with the direction that okay you need to catch this to go to that city Marsa Alam and then on the way you will be dropped off like from where you can catch another van too so I fell asleep in that van the the driver nudged me awake it was almost getting it, it was almost dark actually by then and he said like okay I mean my Arabic was very very primitive he just nudged me where to get up I had my backpack, he said like, hey, and I look around and I just see the desert and I'm like, where? And he's like, and I see a one like tiny shack to rent, like a shack, like you, the, the kokas you see in Pakistan, right? But yeah, even a smaller yeah. version, like there were maybe four or five people there. So he's like there, the van come, so I'm, I am I get off like, uh, and uh, Hafila, Hafila was the bus, right? So he says like Hafila, so I get out, I walk up there and I, I was very fortunate, one guy there spoke English. So he was like, so I, I'm like, oh, I need to go to uh, Umaysara. Like I say, Umaysara, and he's like, oh, sit tomorrow. I'm like, what? <laughs> so he was like, yeah, yeah it's going to come. Uh, you can't go now. It's the desert. It's night. No, no cars. No, nothing is going to go. So he's like, you can, uh, one of, you know, those, one of the char pies, like the straw yeah. uh, bed. Like he, he gives me one, they serve me tea, and he's like, now you sleep and then uh, tomorrow like more in the morning maybe at six maybe at seven there might be cars like and every car that goes to Humaysara or anything would stop here for tea and I'm like so at 7 a.m. I stand I move onto the road just to flag any car down nobody stops nothing like nobody they, there's only very far and few cars in between and they're still going to, Mars, uh, to from Marsa Alam to Aswan and so at one point like uh, there's this big water tanker that's coming in and that that guy stops and the hotel like the the, the, the guy who's at the the tea store he says like this is it he's gonna take you so I it's the guy in the water tanker stops like so he gets tea I get on and then he's like he's one of the most amazing people I've met in my life like uh, in the sense that extremely hospitable hospitable extremely humble very lively like and uh, so he gave me a ride and then when we got to when we got to Humaysara I was like so how long are you going to stay here and he was like I'll be here for four hours and then I was like okay don't forget to take me back because obviously it was a tiny village I didn't want to be there for too long I just wanted to pay a visit to the to the shrine of uh, um, Ashazadi who is one of the greatest saints in North Africa and, and one of the one of the main Sufi brotherhoods in North Africa is is descended from his kind of disciple and um, on the way back so I'll tell you I mean this guy he's a poor water tanker driver right he the minute we on the way so once we decide to go back like he comes in this truck like he offers me he brings like a few things for me like an icy cold drink like Coca Cola and I was like the guy did not get it for himself but because uh, he knew like I'm a guest like he, he gave it and I felt like you know he the, he was so generous that something that he wouldn't offer himself he offered to me and brought it solely for me and then even like so I mean one of the things was he said like I think I came here because God sent me to help you as a traveler like I was and for me you were like uh, like brother said like a brother from God so I was like yeah. I, and and you know like and so we 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 decided we started our journey back and then he was going he said like he's going to take me to Marsa Alam which is like a big station from where you can catch a bus back to Cairo so I was like that that's awesome and then I was thinking like in Pakistan you know in humility when somebody who offers you help and you know they've gone well beyond your means what you do is you when you shake your hand at the end of the journey or something you try to pass in a note just to as, a, as an act of kindness right so I 
I plan to do that. So when when we when we were about, he drove his oil tanker into this tiny little bus station, dropped me off, like was bought some more crisps and stuff. And then I thought, like, okay, when when we hugged goodbye and were about to shake hands, I put like a note. I can't remember. Maybe it was fifty dollars or something, or twenty dollars. I, I don't remember. So he, the minute he felt it, he pushed his hands back like so quickly. He was extremely like agitated. I was like, look, look, look. This is not. This is a hadia, like a gift. Maybe take it to your children to buy sweets. He's like, no, no, no. You're dismissing my act of deed by offering me money for it. Like so, he was quite upset. But then, like obviously, he didn't just take any money or anything. And even though I said like it's a gift, like and except, but uh, yeah. So that that encounter was one of the most interesting and like yeah. I felt like mm-hmm. that the timing of the guy and his entire like. So, so that's the thing. Like when you go outside Cairo and the main capital cities, that's where you actually experience the culture and warmth of the people. Because I remember in Cairo, like I was getting ripped off by taxi drivers and stuff. But here, this is a completely different environment. Like I remember multiple people bought me food, even though I never asked for it, or I looked like I needed food, or I had any shortage of money. Multiple people offered to sort of walk with me, escort me, take me from one station to the other, like. And yeah, it was. I think those were the the really amazing moments when I was traveling really slowly, not knowing anyone in a smaller place or a town where you really needed, where you actually saw the beauty of humanity in yeah. general in a way. Yeah, I agree. I certainly had those similar experiences, and there's something truly spiritual about these moments. Okay, so now let's go from the deserts of northern Africa to the mountains of northern Pakistan. Walk me through how did you get into mountaineering and what were some of the initial adventures you went on? I was always fascinated by looking at pictures from my of my father's mm-hmm. expeditions. Right, I knew yeah. like um, even in Lums, like we had Lums Adventure Society. I never had the money to go in the first three four years of my university to actually go on a trip with LAS, but in my four in my third in 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 the third the final quarter of the third year and the fourth year, I started. I was a teaching assistant, so I could make some money, and I finally did my first trip, and that that was really amazing. Like that was like a a small walk to a base camp like Ulter Two, so it wasn't really a hardcore expedition. It was like a day hike, so that was sort of my first kind of trip and then i i pretty much knew like if i had the money and the resources and the gear i would love to do it and i mean i remembered like naturally like i was quite inspired by my father and the and i knew like the ulter 2 was like i think we may we maybe did like the base camp was around 3000 meters or even less than that and i knew my father had been up to almost 7000 meters or just above that so i knew like how much phenomenal in that sense like an effort and a commitment that was and what kind of drove him to do that and those things like so for me for me like yeah so that was always like to try myself to experience that same kind of moment of solitude and grandeur and just that sheer experience away from away from the natural or the comfortable amenities that you get in in your modern day life to actually be in a purely natural environment exposed to elements and feel like the total magnitude and immensity and the beauty of the nature in a way after a few years of hiking and trekking which involved getting a few bouts of acute mountain sickness once while climbing in pakistan and any other time at everest base camp usman had already started thinking bigger an expedition was only a suggestion away and she suggested we should do an expedition in pakistan of a and and try to do something to try to get to an altitude that you haven't done before like maybe 6000 yeah. meters plus before that the highest altitude i'd gained was 5000 meters and that was on my at the last leg of my trip when i was retracing ibn batuta's diaries was to go to one of the mountain passes between pakistan and afghanistan i did like mm-hmm. a two two and a half three day hike actually to get to a shard pass and back and that pass was 5000 meters i thought okay i've been to 5000 meters what's the next interesting benchmark that i can do and also within my skill and capabilities without putting yourself at risk and 
and to pinpoint a mountain that is doable and also like mm-hmm. exciting and a thrilling adventure and you learn something as well so sonia peak was like the the mountain that i actually in the end pinned down interesting enough at first i thought like lela peak because lela peak is like 6400 or maybe no 6100 meters i think can't remember exactly okay. and it is a beautiful mountain and like the very yeah it's very steep <laughs> karakoram range but you know like that's the beauty when you haven't climbed yeah. and you don't know anything about mountains you think that's okay amazing. this is like steep i've skied down on a similar like 45 degree slope but it is one of the most difficult mountains to climb. so that's what i when i realized lela peak is it, not just then like actually in fact i called like mm-hmm. quite a few porters and guides in pakistan and all of them said like uh, i mean lela peak is a li- <laughs> nobody none of them denied outrightly but all of them said like oh this is very difficult like i they they didn't yeah. know anyone in the pakistani they knew some porter who had been and i think they were part of the expedition but I don't believe any Pakistani porter or climber has climbed uh, Lela Peak unless I'm mistaken now mm. or it has happened lately but because one the, the, there's a few reasons for it it's not above 8000 meters so it doesn't count as a glorious mountain so only very keen and very technical people want to climb Lela Peak because I I would think it's as risky as climbing K2 but with less glamour associated with it I mean I'm sure K2 has got a lot more challenges but Lela Peak is also in in some in in certain parts it's extremely difficult to to climb yeah so yeah so sonia peak yeah, look exactly. like uh look like uh when when i and the good thing with sonia peak was a lot of people had climbed it i mean i think there were there were at least like four or five expeditions and there was a post on summit post as well so there was like not just local information but like uh, let's i think there was one guy i can't remember his name right now but i think he's a scottish guy who'd written the post on summit post about sonia peak and how he graded it he it was i think uh, alpine grade ad or something which means like it's difficult but not challenging or something so it's it's may it's like moderate difficulty so if you've if you're a good trekker and you've got sufficient experience of trekking up to 4000 meters 4500 meters then it should be doable for you uh, depending on if you're fit and stuff yeah So yeah. so Sonia Peak sounded mm-hmm. like the good and then w- mm-hmm. I was very fortunate I got in touch with a guide who in fact had climbed it so all of those things started to fit in 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 place in a in a nice way so Yeah what were the next steps and when did you decide to leave So I so I targeted to go to Sonia Peak in um, July or August which is considered like a very good time as well but then we had certain logistical issues and then my friend she couldn't make it any longer i was like okay who's the best person that you can get in touch with who's who will be keen so i got i got my younger brother who wasn't very fit at the time but he seemed hooked on the idea he was very keen he wanted to try it the only hiking trip that i would say he'd done was he'd been to machu picchu the done the lares trek which is like around 3000 meters but that was still 2 years ago so he wasn't keeping very fit and he was in pakistan so he had like roughly a month and a half so the two of us signed up we organized everything so the good thing was the name of the guide because i had no prior expedition experience my most exped- experience was roughly 2 to 3 days and this was going to be a, an expedition of minimum 10 days that was a minimum like it could have stretched to 15 days because you're climbing 6000 meters 6400 meters you need to acclimatize you need to keep buffer days for inclement weather or a window where you can't climb and you need to all sorts of eventualities and just to get to the base of the mountain from shimshal which yeah. is the last village it's like a 3 days hike so 3 days going 3 days coming back and 3 days climbing let's say you still have like a fair bit of and that's just like boom boom mm-hmm. boom like without any kind of eventuality or and if everything goes to plan having secured a local guide who had already climbed Sonia Peak and roping in his younger brother on their stand the expedition Osman by now had a small team consisting of several porters and livestock it was the 15th of september that i flew out actually so i flew by on turkish airways from london to via istanbul to islamabad and the plan was i mean i literally had booked flights because i had, i could only take like 2 to 3 weeks off so i taken 3 weeks off from work and i knew so i i wanted to squeeze 
I wanted to optimize my time as much as I could. So th- I was going to, so I flew out from London on the evening, landed in Pakistan at 6 a.m. Uh, or 4 a.m. And at 6.30 was my flight from Gilgit, Islamabad to Gilgit. So my brother met me at the airport. The flight was delayed by one hour. We literally rushed from my international counter to the domestic counter, caught the flight to Gilgit. I had a friend who was posted in uh, Gilgit at the time. I had asked him, he was very gracious to organize like the ride for us from uh, Gilgit airport all the way to Shimshal, which is like an eight hour journey roughly. So we landed in Gilgit around 9.30, 10 a.m. Had like a breakfast, like my first paratha and omelets after like, I don't know, uh, I was really craving, like I had a delicious uh, paratha omelet there. And then we went to, uh, because the vehicle that came to pick us up wasn't very suited for off-road because <laughs> you, Karakuram Highway goes all the way to Pasu almost from where then you have to take yeah. like the off-road to Shimshal. So it's like a rocky road. So then we waited for the Jeep to be replaced. And by, by the time we started the journey, oh yeah, the interesting thing was we had to meet the guide on the way in uh, Aliabad. So we had to pick him okay. and the supplies as well. So we get to Aliabad like two and a half hours, three hours later. I can't remember exactly. And then uh, we stopped there. The guide was like literally in preparation. So he's getting the food and stuff. And I'm like, you were meant to be ready. I've flown from London all the way. You knew we, we've spoken like a hundred times that we don't, we yeah. won't have a lot of time window. So we, you have to have everything prepared. And then like, so anyway, things don't work according to your clock. So I think we, we, and there was another spanner thrown in the middle. Like he was like, oh, we have to get a permit from the AC office. I was like, what kind of permit? And he's like, oh, because, uh, you know, it's where Sonia Peak is close to the Chinese border. So you need to get a permit before that. I was like, but we're Pakistani citizens. He's like, yeah, but we need to. And I was like, but you knew that. Why didn't you organize it? He's like, oh, I did try to, but you know, like it's this. So then thankfully, like one of my friends who was in in civil administration in Gilgit managed to expedite that. They agreed that, okay, mm-hmm. once the we can still go ahead and they'll fax the permit to us. And then there was yeah. another interesting twist. The guide had interestingly, because he thought like he's going, taking this expedition, he contacted somebody else, like who was incidentally happening to be from Lums, the university I went to. And Lums tried to do an expedition to Sonia Peak a couple of years ago. They couldn't do it. And uh, yeah. this guy, uh, uh, Saad Jaffri, uh, he was on that expedition. So Nameth had told him that, do you want to join a, an expedition that is going? Obviously, without informing us. And so there was this <laughs> third guy. And I'm like, who's this guy? I could recognize his face. And he's like, the guy tells me, oh, he's joining. I was really upset. I was like, how... Yeah. I mean, we planned this expedition. You're bringing a third person think? that we don't know. Yeah. Does he have the right gear? Is he able mm. to climb? Because if he can't, like, or something happens... It, it affects all of you. It yeah. jeopardizes yeah. the entire expedition, yeah. right? So I was quite... But then, obviously, I spoke to the guy. Like, we... I, I was... I mean, he's he was a brilliant guy. Like, in retrospect, I'm really happy he came because... I mean, not just, like, he added, like... It made it three of us, but he was very lively, very jovial exceptional comradeship and a very generous and a humble human being as well. Like one of the best things was he brought like a lot of food, like home cooked food uh-huh. in sealed plastic <laughs> bags. Like, you know, like uh, parathas, kadai, yeah. shami kebab, chapli kebab, <laughs> what not. Like, I mean, I was like, dude, like at the beginning, I was thinking like, why are you joining? And now I'm so grateful, like yeah. during the expedition that you are here. And he was the most experienced in the group too. So he had more experience because yeah. he, he was the president of Lums uh, Adventure Society and he'd done a fair amount of climbing and stuff. So he knew like what to bring and what to, and a lot more experience too. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, so it was, so yeah, then Saad joined us and there was another girl like who was going to hitch a ride with us. And she was, uh, I think she was from Indonesia and she was a cyclist and Namath had organized her to sort of uh, cycle down from Karakoram Highway back to down to yeah. Gilgit and Islamabad. So we were giving her a ride. So it was like a very, like, thankfully, uh, it was a Jeep that we had rented uh, or my friend had organized actually. So we all fed in and we all got to Shimshal. And in Shimshal at night, like, I was like, guys, look, we're running, we're already, let's plan to start the expedition right away tomorrow. 
so we walk start walking tomorrow so then uh, everyone agreed actually i was the worst in the sense that i was least acclimatized i mean i was i had flown like tired literally for the past 24 hours i was traveling and uh, that was a bad idea actually because we set out early, the next day in the morning like with our entire entourage of some a yak a couple of donkeys some few sucklings in tow and then we had like four <laughs> five porters we weighed all the equipment the food and everything and distributed it evenly and set out and then the first day i think shimshal is around 3100 200 and we went to a place called zart gorbin which is at 4000 meters bad idea because in a day after so much traveling you're straight away gaining 900 meters i had like a pretty shattering headache like it's been consistent every time i get to 4000 meters i get a bad headache <laughs> but then like so i i once i vomited that night after dinner like i felt like a lot better slept the next morning i woke up pretty fine however we were continuing our journey so the next day our plan was to go a bit further but after like maybe so the first day we did like 8 7 8 hours of hike got uh, to zartkorben the next day we did like probably around about uh, 500 meters so we were at 4500 meters at a place called shapodin which was beautiful mm-hmm. like you're literally surrounded by mountains there's like a flat plain where we could even play one tip cricket like fortunately it was they had like a makeshift uh, shepherd hut there too so we could actually yeah. cook inside and stuff but then uh, still sleep in the tents and stuff so because they have mm-hmm. all along these uh, sort of the route they had different places where they had stone kind of huts like makeshift temporary shelters because when they leave their uh, livestock to graze up in the higher greener yeah. pastures like it takes a few days journey so they've built these temporary things for the shepherds like and um and yeah so we that day every one of us felt like on the second day a bit more altitude sick because we had gained yeah. even more altitude so we stayed there had our breakfast and a lunch there rested and the next day we did like a long push for 8 9 hours and got to mendikshla along the way we crossed like a beautiful mountain pass boysen pass oh it was beautiful like 5000 i think okay. Bo- boysen pass was around 5500 yeah 5000 meters so the highest altitude we attained but the beautiful thing of getting to boysen pass was you're still feeling more altitude sick but after that there's like a long descent so the next day we were going to camp at 3900 meters and this is the thing typically like when you're climbing right you have to go up and down so you acclimatize very well and they say like you should never sleep more than 500 meters every night so with getting to boysen pass at 5000 meter and descending like really acclimatize as well like after 3 days like we were all feeling like so mendikshla was around 3900 meters we were all feeling like pretty fit and like didn't have any headache like that's where we actually bought a go like we found a go not found like cuz the shepherds were there so we got a goat from there had a super nice meal in mendikshla and then uh, after that i think that the next day we went to the base camp d which is even further down like 3300 meters and that is a bit uh, like you know a bit of a downer in the sense that if you're going down you know like you have to climb mm-hmm. 6200 meters so there's an it adds like 300 3000 meters of ascent so yeah that was that was the and then we did like the next once we got to the we decided like a smaller team that was going to attempt the summit and it was me by then actually uh, saad were, who joined us like the, this guy like who was he had to return back due to a family emergency which was very sad like because he was a great companion and like uh, and i mean he left us all the great food as well so it was like i mean yeah i i really wish like maybe if i do another expedition like he's definitely one of the top people on the list to reach out to because a uh, really nice guy very humble very generous great com- companion for to be out in the mountains and has a similar view on on nature and perspective of it and yeah So yeah so Saad sadly yeah. had to ten turn back so we when we got to the then Temur me Nemat and we had two one very strong guy like uh, Javed ex- exceptionally fit guy he and we got like cook who was also very fit like Jeff Jeff the chef so the five of us 
decided to climb and then uh, Nemat's uncle like who was just like accompanying us on the trip because he wanted to go like who he was i think well above his 60s uh he really wanted to go climbing so he joined us too and then we had like we did i think that was the real adventure where it started because so far like you're really trekking on like well trodden paths where the shepherds have moved to so it wasn't really mm-hmm. like difficult terrain there were difficult sections of it but nothing like too brutal like and now yeah. like when you had to climb the mountain there's literally no way up you have to chart your own way there's scree slopes there's rocks there's inclined paths and so yeah that and you're literally like on the mountain so you need to be very careful about water where you can you need to find like the ice melting from where to pitch and fortunately like this is where you know like where a good guide and somebody who's done this really helps like Javed and Jeff and Nemeth were Javed and Jeff were like really had a good keen eye and they knew where to pitch where to set up camp how to do it and literally we were like making rock shelters so we were still pitching our tent but like they they were like you know tents are fine but like in the case of an avalanche or anything like the, these rock shelters are the best and so we were all like huddling up like that was our mess tent kitchen and sleeping center and obviously you want to retain heat as well and they had like their own super they had like plastic sheets so you could see the sky as well and then tie the rope around that rock sort of ledge so that you're in a mini igloo with a plastic sheet as the as your roof yeah, so it's like how many of you like six six yeah uh, there's six of us me temur nemo javed uh, jeff and an chacha ji yeah <laughs> it, it it was like we're literally like uh, lying down side by side next yeah. to each other but yeah. it was i think though that's when you start appreciating like the phenomenal views as well as you start going up like everything starts looking tiny and tiny and mm. you're getting more excited obviously it's more tiring too because the gradient becomes a lot more steeper there's no flat sections of the journey like you cl- you're literally climbing every day so what was the push to the summit like Yeah that was one of the toughest I think that was really really tough because the last night we camped at around 5500 meters so you're still getting an altitude sickness I'd never slept at 5500 meters so that was a really different change to and you you have to wake up early the next day it's very cold you're literally touching the snow patches so at 5600 meters 5050 like the snow starts the snow line started it was that was i think yeah the toughest nights in the sense you're more very excited but also at the same time like a little bit apprehensive i knew nemat was very apprehensive because he knew like you know what what are the weather changes he's not with a very experienced team it's super cold like in the morning when we woke up like just wearing your socks and layering up was very difficult and then that was where we had to change our boots to like proper mountaineering boots because the minute you hit snow line you want to be able to wear crampons and everything and your ice axe so we left like everything in our makeshift like shelter that we had built because at 5500 meter we didn't we didn't even bother sh- pitching a tent because the gradient was also slightly slopey so you want to make sure sh- and you're on a bit of a scree slope so we found like a big boulder which could be our backrest and around that we built like a semi circular fortress and slept inside there cooked ate and we 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 kind of decided like okay the forward party would be Javed who's really fit he'll be he and Jeff would be leading the route and then uh, me and Timmy in the middle and at the tail end would be Chacha ji Nemeth would be ahead of us tail end is Chacha ji and uh, so like it's that way like the top 3 then me and Temur and then Chacha ji as as the anchor at the bottom and then we started moving like literally like i could not feel my toes it was so cold but we knew that we were very fortunate that this, it was going to be a sunny day in fact throughout this expedition on all days it had been super sunny like and considering it's september like it, we were lucky with the timing too like it's middle to late september now and uh, you're still getting like pretty amazing uh, weather like usually like most of the avalanches have already happened so in that sense it's a bit safer but still like there can be a lot of shifted snow and icy snow so it can there's still a risk so we were always moving like very cautiously um i think that was really tough because every time you took a step you needed to breathe and air is getting thinner and thinner 
So I think by far, like, there's no comparison between this last push and the other days. Like, we woke up, we, we didn't wake up at, uh, I mean, I was up at four, but we didn't leave our base camp until eight. Because I don't know why, I think Namath wanted the sun to come out a bit more, like, be a bit more rested and relaxed and then start a bit later in the day so it's clearer and I'm I'm not sure yeah. like I think we should have maybe set out a bit earlier that would have given us more time because our idea was to do the summit and then descend all the way down to the heat so 3000 meters so all the distance we've done in three days you have to do it like in one single day so so yeah and uh, so yeah we we started our journey there was we took like a few rests every now and then because everyone was getting knackered like and then we hit the final, like, really steep snowy patch where which is probably, like, still maybe two, two, three hundred meters to go. And that's where, like, your literally crampons were life-changing. If we didn't have crampons, like, it would have been pretty much impossible to even try. Or even the ice axis, because if you put your foot down, like, there was at least, like, meter of snow or if not more, like, so your foot would still sink in quite a bit, like a fit or two. Like, but the crampons would then kind of cushion the so and that was my first both of us were like it was the first time wearing crampons and using them as well so there's always that like you know and you're like pretty much exposed because you know like if avalanche happens or you make a stupid mistake you can take everyone down and there were only three of us connected on the line so the further up so then i was like look guys i think we should all be connected and like we should go as one big group as opposed to what if any like we need like, we need one of the experienced more, like, Javed or someone, because Chacha Ji is, was still lagging behind. He's older, so we we decided to yeah. switch with him with one of the more experienced guys in case. So, so we had, like, a little bit of uh, that kind of challenging section, and then Tamur was also kind of getting very huffy and puffy because, you know, like, I mean, everyone was tired, but, like, it, it was more challenging, but we wanted to proceed faster because... When you look back, like, you could see, like, menacing clouds coming. And when you see the clouds, you know, like, you have a very tiny weather window. It's going to rain or snow, which is, if it does, then you have, then you have to retreat. You have to really come down from the snow because we weren't that well experienced. And, and yeah, you don't want to be exposed to elements and then either you get frostbite or get, you will have a very, very uncomfortable night if you can't get back down in yeah. time. So we had to proceed quicker as well. And uh, and yeah, like we, um, there was one or two very challenging sections where we had to tie ropes and then secure ourselves and do that because there were rocks exposed, but also like it was pretty much like, I don't know, I mean, it must be 70 degrees. And when you're at that altitude and you see down and you can see like all the way down and you think like there's, if you have a fall, there's no way to catch your fall or like stop your roll or tumble or whatever. So it was it was daunting in that sense. And then we managed to like, and the technique is you always follow the, wherever you can see like a rocky patch because you know like rocks would be would be more stable. That means how much snow is there. It gives you a bit more idea of the terrain as well. So yeah, so we got to the summit, I think around 11, 11, 20. So it took us like three, three and a half hours, 11, 30 on that day. And then we literally took a few photos, maybe stood there for four or five minutes. And we quickly started our descent. And then I think mm. we got back to the around 8.30, had an amazing celebratory dinner. Uh, it was like, it was a relief. And that's when my body literally went into shutdown mode. Like after that, when we had to go back, like my pace of going back from the had literally, I could feel like I had pretty much burnt out all my energy reserves. Like, you know, when you're getting to here, like, I was quite paced and fast and, like, always at the at the front end, like, the first two, three people to get to the next stop. Whereas on the way back, like, I was literally lagging behind. Like, I was thinking, like, okay, maybe it was my, like, a, done. yeah, yeah I, think, I think it was your body telling you, like, look, dude, I'm done. Yeah, I've had enough. Yeah. What did it feel like to be on the summit eventually? Uh, I think, I think it's, yeah, I think it's, in some ways it's indescribable like in a way like the fact that you've you've you imagine like what it's like achieving yeah it, it's i mean it was a very profound experience in a way that you you've worked so hard for like i don't know the last 
I mean, the last 10, 7 to 8 days for sure, but like even even before that, it's like you've built up expectations, what it would be like. And I would never mm. imagined that I could do something like 6,200 meters. And I'd never done a summit, like a summit about... The only summit I'd done were two, three, like one was like Tupkal, which is around 4,400 meters. But And this was my first... I'd never done a summit in Pakistan. So for me, it was like a very personal moment too like oh it's the and and in a way like I could I felt like what my father would have felt like having climbed and done so and also the pristine surrounding and the nature and the peaks that you can see in the surroundings you could even see K2 but on that day you couldn't because it was it, the clouds had like by the time we got to the summit like it was pretty much cloudy but otherwise from the yeah. summit of Sonia Peak you can see K2 like it's much further away because Sonia Peak is the northern reaches of Karakrum towards China whereas K2 is on as a, as a bit further on the I would say west side or east from there probably so yeah so it was um, yeah it was quite like yeah it was I think yeah it was a very remarkable moment like I felt like very excited like difficult to describe like or pen it down like how yeah it, yeah, yeah. I think it has to be experienced in person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like you've, it's a goal that you've fulfilled in a way that you thought is you're not really sure you'll be able to achieve it. And it's all the preparation that you've put in and a um, few years of your life. You're just thinking about it and just now you've achieved it. You've thought about getting there, doing the summit, yeah. but you hadn't really planned for like, okay, well, how would you, you have, you have to, to walk back. Again, back down. You have to climb the same path that you came through. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Initially, <laughs> we I mean, yeah, like initially I had a more ambitious plan to go climb down the other side and end up on, mm-hmm. and uh, through Kunjab National Park and then organize like somebody to pick us up from another part, like once we hit yeah. the Karakoram Highway. But that was a much longer journey and I knew like all of us including my brother where we were like at the end of our like limits of uh, energy and capacity and so yeah we, we backtraced literally the same route we came back because one like mm-hmm. we knew the terrain knew the route knew what to expect and two like yeah. yeah i mean so what do you think um adventure means to you hmm that's a good question yeah for me personally an adventure is where you get to experience nature it has to have an experience of nature has to have some kind of for me personally and that's my definition like has to have a little bit of an element of spirituality too and i find like i had like i could praying in the mountains is a very profound experience too right you're like in a tiny tent you're huddled you're literally surrounded by nature pristine nature no modern gadgets nothing to distract your thoughts so when you're there you're literally there and you're there you're kind of at risk too so you're praying like you're literally focused more profoundly on your on on your you're more humble and your your humility is more like sort of you you're more exposed in a way you know so you you're you're it kind of kills your sort of ego and arrogance in a way like you know because there's so many things that are beyond your control that can happen in nature and when you're doing any sort of outdoors activity that can just trigger so it makes you more humble it makes you more so for me, like, I felt like, yeah, I mean, I had like, you know, one of the ways I judge my kind of headspace is also the dreams that I see. And every night, and I still remember some of my dreams like that I had, like in, uh, when I was on the expedition in Sonia Peak, it was so clear. Like right now, like when I, on days when I wake up, I, even if I have dreamt, I could not remember a dream. But like, it was so much, there's so much profound clarity in a way because you're, you you you're so not distracted with the normal distractions of the world you're more focused you're more in the environment more in the nature more connected to it and and yeah i think there's a little bit about adventure is that like it should push your it should have an a physical dimension where you're pushing or learning something new so it may be as simple as like doing something that you do every day but you learn something different about it like yeah so so that I think, yeah. And, okay. yeah. Interesting. What plans do you have for the future? Do you have any more adventure planned? I haven't got anything concrete. And it's partly because of a few things like I've been thinking about, you know, or I have like the external or familial pressure to settle down to. So, but, you know, you need to think about those things. But also like 
work related items but i mean one thing that i really want at some point i really haven't planned but i mean i don't know how much i want it right now but like because if i did really really want it i would have done that now but so it's it's to cycle to pakistan and incorporate like yeah. my my ibn batuta as continue that journey from from not exactly where i left it off but even do like yeah do it in mm. mix that with a journey to pakistan and go slowly that way like you actually experience like without that would be like a human power journey i imagine and yeah even if i yeah, do it in talk, sections like this about this we talked about the pakistan journey yeah, yeah, yeah it's <laughs> I think I I've, I've been talking about it maybe for a year or two now like every time cuz that's when when somebody asks me like what would be your next adventure that's the first thing that kind of jumps out at me but I think lately mm-hmm. also because I've been doing I I've, I've been very fortunate in the last 2 3 years to have been able to do a lot of smaller trips like go on uh, many different like Sonia Peak expedition was in that I also managed to go like every time skiing 2 3 times cycling trips and stuff so that kind of when you're doing these things like it sort of dissipates your like it yeah. kind of fulfills part of your travel urge in a way so you're not you're like you feel like i'm not completely like but you haven't done yeah. like a big objective it's it's, uh, it's in the back of your mind and yeah. i don't think it's going to go away until you do it i, I yeah I, i yeah and i hope so i hope like it'll be in the next year or so then if 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 yeah. okay. i mean to be fair quarantine would have been this would have been the perfect time to hit the road get your laptop yeah. everyone's working from home i could pretty much work from anywhere right now apart from like mm-hmm. that don't have to be in london and just cycle like uh, yeah that's true and that way you don't even yeah. have to take like a big time off from work either so i've been asking um the people that have been interviewing on the podcast that um what are you most grateful for right now i think health that that's that's one of the most and to be fair like i'm i mean i ha- i'm very fortunate like to be able to work from home like that i'm healthy all my general needs are met like and that i have the good fortune to even be thinking about planning journeys and doing something beyond like the normal day to day life i think a lot of people don't have either the resources or due to various um aspects of their life or constraints around it they can't do it but i think i think the thing is i think everyone has those constraints it's just what is your priority in life at that moment in time and i think like when i like i i really feel like when i look back at the time when i went to when i did my four month trip of the ibn abdu the journey i think it I had all these constraints I had job I had family pressure you were thinking like what is this stupidity like to quit your job <laughs> perfectly good job and go traveling like and my father was actually very supportive because he uh, he had that sort of adventure streak in him or he always loved those things so he was very supportive of the idea but for somebody who's not known and you know like in Pakistan it's not a typical thing that people do or have the luxury or ability to do it but I remember at that time I had immense clarity that this was my priority. Work was not any other thing wasn't. I wanted to go and I wanted to and I think like yeah it was it was for more multiple reasons for spiritual reasons for adventure reasons for learning for educational reasons all of those things combined gave me like uh, a lot more clarity in what I was going to do. Yeah, I remember how you know we spoke about how traveling really help you develop as a person i think it puts a lot of things in perspective like i think i'm much of a changed person i am now than i was before before i went on that journey yeah. i think every yeah. experience does but like for me that was educational i i learned like a bit more arabic i know so much i mean you can read about a place but when you actually go there and experience that it gives you like you know little things like you you would know like okay in morocco people speak arabic but you don't know why or how or and then you know so much more when you actually go there and experience and talk to people and see the culture and realize how much similar you are no matter where you go and how and how there is like a still like a flavor of diversity and plurality in a way awesome thanks so much man thanks a lot thank you very much for having me i hope like yeah <laughs> That's cool. Oh, we nice. should we should go on a cycle ride soon like socially distance yeah. of course. 
I can't wait to see what Osman gets up to in the future. And I'm sure to follow his journey. Probably even join him on a bike ride to Pakistan someday. If Osman's story and courage to dream big and achieve things has inspired you, please let me know. I'd love to know your thoughts. Also, if you know anyone who has a great story to share and is a true giant in disguise, please send over an email to hello at tripakistan.com.